Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I am delighted to welcome you to this presentation of the spring class of fellows at the Academy. I'd like to begin by thanking our longtime and beloved benefactor and former trustee, Nina von Maltzahn, whose generosity has made this evening possible. I know I speak for everyone involved in this great tradition of ours when I say how sorry I am that we can't have an audience here at the Hans Arnold Center, but must once again bring our friends and supporters in by Zoom because of the current public health conditions. Uh, this is, of course, far from ideal, but I prefer to look on the bright side. I'm glad we have this technology that makes it possible for us to convene and bring the world to the Academy. I'm also proud that the Academy presented a nearly full calendar of in-person events uh, during the fall semester. Omicron, of course, has intervened, but I'm cautiously optimistic that the calendar for in-person events that we have planned for the spring, which will get going in earnest in March, uh, will be equally successful. And like many others, I am hopeful, though I am not an epidemiologist, that we are slowly approaching the end of the pandemic. To be sure though, this has not been the easiest of times. As most of you know, the Academy opened its doors in the 1990s at a time of great, even unbridled optimism. The Cold War was over, Germany was unified, the global economy was for the most part booming. The creation of the Academy was an expression both of the depth of US-German relations and of the desire to continue strengthening the relationship, not only through existing political and military channels, but also through intellectual and cultural exchange, through scholarship in the arts, through the highest expression of our common civilization. Today, it has to be admitted, we're a long way from the heady 1990s. The pandemic has been a harrowing experience. Our institutions are under considerable pressure. And as we sit here today, it is impossible to ignore the fact that a war may break out in Europe only a thousand miles to the east of here, where a large Russian army is posed, poised to invade Ukraine. It is hard not to be distracted by that presence and the possibility of bloodshed. At the same time, here at the Academy, I believe that even with this foreboding background, we are doing the right thing. We are continuing to support scholarship and artistic creation, as well as in-depth engagement between Americans and Germans. That's an engagement that continually renews and expands the bonds between us. We do this in good times and we do it in difficult ones. At the Academy, we study democracy and its opponents. We examine the ways we can keep our planet habitable. We deepen our understanding of the past, compose music, translate literature, so that we can share in the riches of the cultural production of both of our societies. We do this during a pandemic and we do this when war looms. And I think all of us know in our bones that this is exactly as it should be and that doing it here in the great city of Berlin is an expression of the vitality and richness of our cultures. So I wanna thank our 48th class of fellows for joining us here at the Academy and helping us advance our mission. The fellows gathered here are a remarkable group and shortly they will describe their work which is quite extraordinary in its range. They will tell us about the history of the laws of war, the complexities of identity in the Maghreb, Middle East and Europe, the search for justice across borders, the costs of extracting the materials we need to transition to a cleaner economy, the culture of concert going and public health challenges that despite years of effort still claim millions of lives every year. I've touched on only a few of the subjects that our fellows will discuss, and the rest I know are equally fascinating. So let me now introduce this class of fellows. Sitting here with us in the Academy, we have Deborah Amos, Ariela Azule, Javiera Barandiaran, Lauren Benton, Lawrence Douglas, Christopher Gibbs, Tess Lewis, and Eric Wesley. Fellows who could not be here right now are Michael Abramowitz, Du Yun, Damian Fernandez, Howard Coe, and Etel Solingen. 
It is, of course, our tradition to have a keynote speaker, and I'd like to turn now to introduce him. Professor Christopher Marks will deliver that keynote tonight, and we have had many distinguished speakers at the fellow's presentation, but I confess I'm somewhat in awe of Christoph Marks. A theologian and president of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, Christoph Marks is one of the towering figures of contemporary German intellectual life. According to his official biography, his area of expertise is ancient Christianity and the religions of the ancient world. But he has written on an enormous range of subjects, from Ambrose of Milan to AI. He's been a distinguished public intellectual and somehow along the way found time to lead a series of major institutions. Christoph has held chairs in early Christian ecclesiastical history and the history of theology in Jena at Heidelberg and he has taught since 2004 at the Humboldt here in Berlin, where he has also served as the university's president from 2006 to 2010. At that time, he was Germany's youngest university president. In 2011, he became vice president of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy. And on October 20th, he took on his current role as its president. Among his many honors, Professor Marx is, is also a winner of the Leibniz Prize, Germany's highest research funding award, which he received in 2001, as well as the Federal Cross of Merit for his outstanding commitment to ecumenical and Jewish Christian dialogue, which was uh, given to him in 2017. Christo Christoph's uh, prodigious output reminded me of something I heard when I was a college student. Namely, that that incredibly prolific writer and economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, was employing in his attic of, of his house a dozen or more retired academics and their spouses to turn out his many, many books. In view of Christoph's output, I've wondered if he has an entire retirement community working for him. If you consult his author's page on Amazon, you will see that he has written or collaborated on something like 30 books on issues raising, ra ranging from Gnosticism to Hellenism to Martin Luther to conceptions of God's bod in in body in antiquity. I confess my favorite title is What the Hell is Quality on Standards in the Humanities. <laughs> and that page doesn't include the lovely book he sent me when I arrived in Berlin, which is right here, The Monk's Haggadah, a 15th century illuminated codex from the Monastery of Tegernsee, which he co-edited. His webpage, by the way, at Humboldt also lists hundreds of articles. Christoph has been a fellow of the Institutes for Advanced Study in Berlin, Jerusalem, and Princeton, and a visiting fellow of Trinity College, Oxford. He holds honorary doctorates from universities in Sibiu in R Romania, Oslo, and the Lateran University in Rome. He has been elected to more learned societies than one can count. Amid all this productivity, it's also worth noting that he has preserved an incredible sense of humor, which I anticipate we shall soon encounter. I wanna add that I am grateful to Christoph, both for the warm welcome he gave me when uh, I arrived in Berlin and for the continued collaboration of our two institutions. Over the past several years, we've jointly put together a series of events dealing with topics such as transatlantic values, German unification, and other subjects. And we are very much looking forward to our next panel on March 2 at 6 p.m. in Central European time, entitled Accountability, What Does It Mean? How Can It Be Achieved in Policy, Politics, and Law? So now it is my great pleasure, Professor Marchies, to give you both the real and the virtual podium. Thank you so much for that kind presentation of the beginning of this presentation. This evening is dedicated to the presentation of you, the Spring Fellows. Also, we have Winter. 
As president of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, what can I make at the home of our sister academy, the American Academy, the topic of my welcome to the Spring Fellows? I could try to present at least a little bit of the city of Berlin to those who are being presented here in Berlin, to Berlin today. Presentation for presentation, so to speak, a gift for those who will be a gift for the city of Berlin, you, with our presence in the coming weeks and months. I have to confess my puns work better in German because presentation in, in German, present und geschenk are far more closely related in German than in English. How do I present to you this evening during your presentation, the city of Berlin in a short time? The best way is to present it by means of a characteristic example and thus make the fellow's appetite for the city, I hope, curiosity to stroll through the metropolis of Berlin and explore it. it. Makes sense to choose as my characteristic example this evening, the district in which the Arnhold Center, the American Academy is located, and in which we are right now together, Wannsee. To start with this district of my hometown is also obvious because a few days ago, more precisely last Thursday, we had to remember the event that made the name Wannsee known in a terrible way all over the world. Last Thursday was the 80th anniversary uh, of the so-called Wannsee Conference, which took place in a guest house, in a guest house of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, directly opposite across the lake. There at the lake shore, the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, the terror headquarters of the SS, housed in a Baroque palace in the center of the city, used to accommodate guests and hold meetings in an idyllic setting as we have today here. A work meeting of various governmental departments and security police officers with the aim enabling the Reichssicherheitshauptamt to organize the mass murder of the European use even better, a working meeting followed by a breakfast. We will return later to the absurd fact that in the middle of a world war, a meeting followed by a breakfast is called for 12 o'clock, high noon. That means at lunchtime for breakfast. But however, I will begin in another place. Wannsee was a familiar region to me when I went to school in West Berlin. A city, as all of you know, surrounded by the now disappeared Berlin Wall until I graduated from high school in 1980. Wannsee was familiar to me because my parents made it possible for me to become a member of a sailing club nearby, Potsdamer Yacht Club, and to spend all weekends in a boat on the water. The places of remembrance of the glory and catastrophe of Berlin and European Jewry opposite the Arnhold Center were not yet museums at this time. In Max Liebermanns, the famous painter and president of the Prussian Academy of Arts, in Max Liebermanns former summer house, a diving club had set up his training center and the enchanting garden with its flowers you must visit this garden. In this garden, which Liebermann painted so masterfully time and again, was the repository of diving equipment and air bottles. 
The villa of the Wannsee Conference was used as a school hostel for a Berlin district, Neukölln, and at the site of the former Reichssicherheitshauptamt in the city center, one could drive a car without a license and thus practice for the driving test. For us students who sailed on the Wannsee, the buildings on the shore were simply the houses of other clubs devoted to sailing, rowing and diving. Today, I'm ashamed of how little my generation knew at this time about the other shore of Fanzi and how little we asked during those days why these sports clubs owned or could rent such elegant villas. In the meantime, there is a museum, both in the house of the Wannsee Conference and in Max Liebermann's villa. And there are signs on the road to Potsdam pointing to these museums. But how many people, German people, not temporary fellows of uh, the American Academy, but how many people living in Berlin know that these two houses stand in an extremely exciting memorial landscape, which can stand pragmatically for the and paradigmatically for the high points as well as catastrophes of German history. Practically right next to the house of the Wannsee Conference, exactly opposite our building, stands a large sculpture of a lion an extremely large sculpture of a lion upright across to the lake toward the Arnold Center. It's the copy of a sculpture that a Danish merchant uh, had donated and um, which was designed in 1853, designed by the most prominent contemporary Danish sculptor of this time and erected in the then Danish port city Flensburg. With it, a group of Danes wanted to commemorate a great Danish victory. Opposite from here, a great Danish victory. Above all, the great powers of England and Russia had prevented Prussia in 1848 from simply conquering large parts of Denmark and annexing all German settlement areas in the Danish kingdom to the Prussian state. That failed and the lion was commemorating this. The lion, the Danish heraldic animal, was a reminder of the Danish victory about Prussia. However, Denmark's victory did not last long in this century's Europe of nation states and nationalism. And this had consequences for the victory monument. In 1864, Otto von Bismarck succeeded in doing what had been impossible in 1848. Prussia conquered practically all German settlement areas, there's also Flensburg and the sculpture of the lion in Flensburg, which was brought to Berlin as a spoil of now Prussian victory and placed in the courtyard of the verbally translated Prussian main cadet institution, Preußische Kadettenanstalt, and over at Wannsee in Heckesholm, opposite there, not only was a copy of the former Flensburg and now Berlin line erected, but the entire villa colony of Wannsee was named after the Danish island of Alsen. And other places here in the vicinity were also named after important places uh, of the Danish Prussian war. A whole landscape of memory on a war of the Danish-Prussian War of 1864, the landscape in which you are now living as Spring Fellows of the American Academy. More precisely, a memorial landscape that reminded the people at this time of the Prussian victory above, the Danish people. 
Today, there is hardly anything left of the former memorial landscape of the Prussian victory over Denmark in our today's Wannsee district. Most people know a little about it. As I knew as West Berlin school, uh, school child about the House of the Wannsee Conference and the Liebermann Villa. Since the last election, election of last September to the German Bundestag, a representative of the Danish minority, which to this day lives around the city of Flensburg, has been sitting as a member of our parliament in our parliament. For the first time in over 70 years, he has won a direct mandate. Thus, the district of Wannsee, where you are living now, the district of Wannsee has the chance, the opportunity to transfer the hardly understood memories of the Prussian-Danish war into a common European commemoration of the problems of national and nationalistic faces of history in the 19th and 20th century. The chance, an opportunity. In the process, of course, the lion opposite us, the large sculpture of the lion, should not disappear. It is not about monument overthrow as elsewhere, you know, probably, but about contextualization of monuments, common contextualization, German, Danish, German, American fellows, Danish contextualization. Most people who go for a walk over there enjoy the naturalistic sculpture of a mighty lion and have no background knowledge of this heraldic animal and its history. At least as important as the more or less problematic images we have in front of our eyes are the more or less problematic images we make in our minds of the past. Yesterday, Monday, one could see in German television a film reconstruction of the Wannsee Conference, realized by the director Matti Geschonek. In contrast to the two previous attempts to reconstruction, Geschonek, son of a famous actor from the Bertolt Brecht's ensemble, was keen to show not sinister Nazi henchmen, but bureaucrats, who were both assiduous and unscrupulous. The head of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, Reinhard Heydrich, who had invited to the conference and wanted to secure his influence at it, is not presented and was not presented in the film as evil incarnate, but as an affable contemporary with a pleasant voice. Contemporary witnesses report that he was an extraordinarily unpleasant person with a high falsetto voice, but such recollections are, of course, just as much interest-driven images in later tradition as casting for a film in the year 222. The images of Geshonek's television documentary film brutally distanced objectivity. Herfried Münkler, Berlin sociologist, brutally distanced objectivity and debates among bureaucrats about the most efficient organization of a complex process with cognac and canopies. However, it is not about better study conditions for foreign students. There we welcome bureaucrats' attempts to optimize things, but about a gigantic murder of people and masses, which should be organized more effectively. Are the images in yesterday's film right? Are the images in our mind right? Andreas Kilp asked in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, should we actually believe what we have seen in the documentary? Or do we have to relearn 
to distrust the images in order to grasp the truth of history, to relearn to distrust the images. A rhetorical question, of course, that Kilp is asking us here this evening. It really struck me for the first time this days that in the middle of a world war, a meeting followed by breakfast is invited for 12 o'clock. That is lunchtime for breakfast. I promised at the beginning to go into this again at the end. In the research one finds on the Wannsee Conference, bookshelves full of monographs. In the research one finds, if I see right, nothing to this topic, breakfast at high noon. So questions remain. Did the daily routine of bureaucrats on duty shift because they had to stay awake at night in the bunker to protect themselves from bomb attacks? Did Hitler's state copy the Führer and Reich's Chancellor, who also did not start his day until midday? A healthy distrust of what we think we know, breakfast at high noon, a healthy distrust on what we think we know is the beginning of any serious study of the past. Perhaps you're wondering why I'm talking about war and mass murder, an ancient monument to oppression victory and mistrust of images when I'm supposed to be welcoming spring fellows to Berlin. Of course, I could also have talked about the cheerful life at Wannsee, the life in the Villa Colonie Alsen, about the great physicist Hermann von Helmholtz, and the famous physician Ferdinand Sauerbruch, in whose garden at Wannsee the Mittwochsgesellschaft Wednesday Society meets and holds whitey conversations. At least until hairdressers burst out of the undergrowth and cut the hair of the surprised discussants. But, dear spring fellows, even if I had only dealt with a cheerful side, and there is a cheerful side of life in the Wannsee Villas this evening, I would still have had to call for mistrust of my pictures. We historians owe our readers and listeners this disclaimer, mistrust my pictures and texts but we can only call upon the curious to distrust, the people who are always looking for new images, for new images of Wannsee and its villas, for new images of the city of Berlin, of Berliners and of Germany and of Germans and all the people one can meet in this wonderful city with this dramatic history. Because if you're always sitting on the sofa in Villa Arnhold, you don't need to be warned about problematic and false images of the world outside. Go out. Do not be afraid that the planned book will not be finished. That's the way in such institutes for advanced study. The books are written later. Be curious about new images of Berlin, of Berliners, of Germany, of Germans, of all our guests, of the people from different nations uh, living in this wonderful city. But distrust the images you see that, and the images you are see that are created in your head. The search for appropriate images will never be finished, but I hope that your stay, dear Spring Fellows, your stay in Berlin will give rise to a wealth of unforgettable images, the appropriateness of which you will reflect for a long time on to come. Have a good time at the Wannsee 
and in Berlin, and oodles of wonderful new images. Thank you. Christoph, thank you for that very, very interesting reflection on the Vanze as someone who has spent a lot of time around that lion because it's a very nice place to go for a beer on a summer afternoon. Uh, I have often wondered what people make of that. I suppose I should be uh, slightly grateful that you decided not to move on to the Schleswig-Holstein question, which leads naturally from that lion and which as was famously remarked, only three people understood it was so complex. One died, one forgot, and the third went mad, as you well know. Well, that was a wonderful speech. Thank you very much. Let me uh, now say that uh, the fellows are going to give their presentations now. I probably shouldn't have even come back up, but Deborah Amos, alphabetically, it is your fate. No? Christopher, you're first. I apologize. I've messed up everything. Please. Not bad. Good evening. It's a great honor to be the Anna Maria Kellen Fellow at the American Academy this spring. I've been here just 10 days or so and already I'm engaged with my project, which is to look at the musical life of this vibrant city, its past, its present, and its future possibilities. So I'll be attending a lot of concerts and operas uh, in the coming months and have the privilege of discussing the Berlin scene with many of those most involved with shaping it today. Most of my past work has focused on Vienna and I look forward to comparing these two great music cities. I do so as a music historian, the James H. Ottaway Jr. Professor of Music at Bard College and as a festival organizer, the co-artistic director of the Bard Music Festival. My concern is with how concerts are curated, a word that we perhaps most associate with the museum world, but that I think should and could be uh, applied more to musical life. The etymology, of course, is the Latin cura, care. And I'm interested in the careful, thoughtful, thematic, programming of concerts and festivals, and then how best to frame and contextualize them through talks and panels, exhibits, essays, program books, and so forth, what's sometimes called public musicology because it addresses non-academic audiences. The formal title of my project is Connecting Music to Life, Public Musicology and Curating Concerts. It seems to me that this is a particularly urgent time to make connections between music and the world, not just because of the new challenges posed by the COVID pandemic, which has had such a devastating impact on arts institutions, but also because of issues around the expansion and inclusiveness of the concert and opera repertory as well as endless laments about the so-called death of classical music, a patient that always seems to be on the verge of dying, yet always somehow seems to survive. And there's perhaps no better place to, than to do this right now than Berlin. The history of the arts here in the 20th century alone, as the city reacted to and was transformed by two world wars and the Cold War, is enough to remind the historian that there have been extraordinary situations in the past 
And as with that past, the fallout of the current crisis will be long lasting and offer further opportunities to reimagine for new images of the public experience of concert life. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tess Lewis, and it's my great honor to be the Berlin Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. I'm a freelance essayist, critic, and translator from French and German, and it's that last hat that I will be wearing here this spring. My project is a translation of Lutz Seiler's second novel, Stern 111. This novel takes its title from an iconic East German transistor radio, a device that awakened the protagonist, Karl Bischoff, to, a, to the world, to the wider world, when he was a child in Thuringia. A portrait of a poet as a young man, Seiler's highly autobiographical novel captures the brief season of utopian anarchy in Berlin immediately following the collapse of the GDR. Awarded the 2020 Leipzig Book Prize, this novel evokes the heady atmosphere of hope and disorientation, of revolutionary idealism and opportunism that filled the ruined capital in 1990. Seiler conveys the sense of liberation and possibility felt both by the East Germans who left for the West and by those who stayed behind, but without sentimentalizing either group. In search of an artistic life, the aspiring poet Karl leaves his provincial hometown in for Berlin in December 89. And there he falls in with a group of idealists, punks, artists, anarchists, and uh, revolutionaries whose mission is to sabotage the breeding ground of capital through immediate redistribution by occupying hundreds of empty buildings, or in their words, making them livable for them, of course. A mission they finance by stealing tools and materials from West German construction sites, running unlicensed bars, and selling bits of the wall, both real and counterfeit, to tourists and foreign speculators. Through Carl's adventures and misadventures, Seiler raises a number of timely questions. How, for example, does one establish an authentic independent existence against the pull of powerful, seductive, political, and ideological currents? What is the public good? And to whom do cities belong? Stern 111 is steeped in the culture of the GDR and is based on an actual group of squatter activists who set up a network for occupying abandoned buildings in Prenzlauerberg, Mitte, and Kolwitzkiez. Some of you may remember the semi-underground bar Die Assel in Oranienburger Straße, once the group's headquarters, now an Italian designer furniture dealer. The topography of East Berlin the hastily abandoned apartments, the overgrown craters left by allied bombs, the makeshift bars and restaurants established in derelict storefronts forms a crucial backdrop to the political activism engendered there in the winter of 1990. Indeed, two of Stern, Stern 111's central themes are the transformation of the Berlin cityscape and the way history is preserved or erased in private and public spaces, a very pertinent theme as Dr. Markish has just eloquently reminded us. When I'm not at my desk coaxing or rather wrestling at Seiler's words into English and discussing some of the trickier passages with him, I will be tracking the main character's haunts and looking for, for traces of the city's more ephemeral social and political history at the close of the 20th century. In other words, looking for old and new images of Germany. In March, I will be giving a talk on translation and the contested idea of fidelity to the original text using examples from my own translations of works by Walter Benjamin, Ernst Jünger, Lukas Beafus, Maya Hadela, Christian Angot, and Anne Weber, among others. I hope you will join me then either in person or online, whatever's possible. I'm profoundly grateful for this opportunity to work on my translation here at the Academy. Thank you to the staff and all the supporters of the Academy. My translation will be much better for it. Thank you.
Hello, uh, good evening. My name is Eric Wesley. I'm so very honored to be here with you at the American Academy in Berlin as the Ellen Maria Gorenson Fellow. I look forward to sharing time and ideas with all the beautiful people and places on campus and beyond. I hail from Los Angeles, California, where I was born and raised. I continue to habitually reside and work there. Now, for the past 15 or so turns around the sun, I found myself doing the same in Berlin. It has been some time since my last stay in the city, and I feel especially energized by the pending inspiration and opportunities afforded to me by the, this great institution. It's with deep respect and humility that I briefly present to you some of my interests and methods concerning my work. I consider myself a formalist, also a conceptual artist. A fun fundamental mode of production is sculpture or object making. I do often make pictures, paintings, drawings, photographs, etc., as well as engage with film and video. Architecture is of uh, particular uh, importance to me. I, in recent years, I've been thinking and behaving in a way that conjures up my own early artistic development, namely performance, and closer still to my artistic blue hand, forgive my uh, German, the poetry, which I abandoned as a teenager. Just a few months ago, I penned the first poem in decades, if anybody wants to hear it. No, good, it's not done yet. Okay, it's a trifle. It goes like, I think I used to be a poet. Now in all seriousness, uh, please allow me to attempt a description of or perhaps an excuse for my approach to art. Paramount is my interest in science from classical physics to cosmology and everything in between, which is to say quantum mechanics. And then I am a contemporary artist, meaning I must move fast, snow, often compelling me to act now and think later analyze and repeat. This modus operandi often produces misunderstandings, intentional or not. Abstraction, humor, and a jab at metaphysics may result, hopefully, creating a balance or levity through art and science. On the topic of science and art, I would like to express my interest in cataloging the history of the two disciplines converging and or cooperating throughout the ages. I believe the promotion and inclusion of a science-based forum would be a great asset and benefit to the American Academy in Berlin. Let me get back to the topic at hand here. What am I doing? I don't know. I have an idea of what an object might look like its potential form, its timing and scale, et cetera. And I may eventually envision or predict what it might mean, how it will go down. But as a whole, I can't say I know what I'm doing. For me, this is a crucial aspect of my work. That being said, I would like to share with you a few knowns. One is uh, the, the physical and performative manifestations of the project should be in accordance with our current understanding of the physical universe, the relationship of the baryonic, that is the whole of sub subatomic matter, to dark matter, which they're getting a look at now, to dark energy, which is the archetype of the unknown, an enigma to say the least. 
without but then two for, without further speculation as to the physical nature of the project i would like to add that the dimensional anomaly of time is perhaps the overarching theme three the artistic origins of my project can be traced back to a single sculpture began approximately 12 years ago and has it, its roots in turn entwined within our understanding of time and its relationship to the spatial dimensions. Speaking of time, I think I've used up just about enough of yours today. So with that, I look forward to sharing more about my project at my May Day lecture. And of course, until then, getting to know my fellow fellows, the staff and leadership at the Academy. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ariela Aisha Azulay, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be a fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. Uh, my work has long uh, been to interrogate museums and archives and to delineate the role they play in the colonial project, as well as to describe these sites as uh, arenas of struggle and decolonization. In my most recent book, Potential History, Unlearning Imperialism, I study the role of museums and archives in the destruction of colonized people's culture, and, part and I participate in the configuration of forms of restitution and repair. Yet, uh, there were still destroyed worlds that I had yet to attend to when I finished the book or even see. When I, when I was close to finishing potential history, I felt the joy of completing 10 years of exhaustive research, but I was also troubled by what I came to see during the writing process, something I alluded to in the book's preface. And let me quote one paragraph from the preface. I would have loved to be part of an identity group. I wish I could be able to say I belong to my community but there is no community to which I truly belong. I own many objects and artifacts and some works of art. None of these, even those I inherited from my parents or received uh, as gifts from family and friends were handed to me as a recognition of my belonging. I have not a thing from Algeria uh, where my father and his ancestors were born and lived until, uh, the, late, uh, until the, er the early 60s, or from Andalusia, from where my maternal family was expelled at the end of the 15th century. This brief paragraph, which referenced a whole history of colonial dispossession, re-education, shame, and pain, has led me to my next research project, for which I am here, questioning the extension of French colonization, sorry, questioning the extension of French citizenship to the Jews in Algeria, just a few decades after the French colonized Algeria, and studying uh, the role of this citizenship in the destruction of their world. This group of Arab Jews and Berber Jews was singled out from the rest of the indigenous population and its members were forced to become French citizens in their own country. The objects to which they were attached and their modes of living became obstacles they had to discard, thus proving to their colonizing benefactors their worthiness for citizenship they had not asked for. In a generation, they stripped themselves of many things that could identify them as other than French. What did it mean to our ancestors to shed their material, corporal, or cosmological existence? What does it mean to their descendants not to have any artifacts from the place where their ancestors lived for centuries? What happened to their material and spiritual world, to the rights, knowledge, and beliefs inscribed in, the, in these objects? Could it really be vanished? 
beyond the physical and emotional world loss of the Arab and Berber Jews or simply Muslim Jews of North Africa, this series of questions prompted my inquiry into the role of both the French colonizing powers in North Africa and the Zionists in Palestine. Through my own family life in Algeria, I studied the process through which in less than a century, an offspring of an indigenous Algerian Jew and Palestinian Jew cannot simply say, I am Algerian or I am Palestinian. More than just a personal reckoning, family history, or an implied return, this inquiry interrogates the structures of colonial dispossession, traces processes of world loss, and asks, is this process reversible? And what kind of repair, which is increasingly called decolonization, is still possible? In this context, I am paying a particular attention to jewels uh, and the crafts of making them. While the Jews had to leave Algeria in 1962, the jewels they crafted stayed there. And some of them are also in French, German, and other European museums. Considering objects, people, and their entanglement, I am here at the, Academy, at the American Academy uh, of Berlin in Berlin to revisit what is called emancipation, the emancipation of the Jews, to question the violent taxonomy that turned different Jews, Arab Jews, Berber Jews, Muslim Jews, into a unified historical subject, the Jews, turned them into citizen, endowed uh, this historical subject, the Jews, with an imperial nation state, and linked the Jews to a certain body of objects, Judaica. The aim of the project is to offer a potential history of Jewish and Muslim conviviality through a series of open letters to the living and the dead, to family members and elected kin such as Franz Fanon, Hannah Arendt or Sylvia Winter, I am asking what could it mean to invoke the presence of Arab, Berber or Muslim Jews through the jewels they crafted and to consider the condition of being defined by one's craft as a mode of inhabiting one's place in the Ummah, in the Muslim state. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and everyone at the Academy for welcoming me this uh, term here as the Axel Springer Fellow. My name is Javiera Barandiran. I'm an associate professor in the Global Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And until a few months ago, I served also as a faculty director for the University of California for Education Abroad programs in Chile and Argentina. Uh, I'm an STS scholar, that's for Science, Technology, and Society. And my work explores the intersection of science, environment, and development in Latin America, primarily. At the American Academy in Berlin, I will be writing my book called Driving Development, the Lithium Trade in the Americas, in which I examine the transnational history of the oldest, uh, the three oldest lithium brine mines in the world, located in Chile, Argentina, and the US state of Nevada. In the book, I asked, whose expertise shaped global mineral markets and what possible futures did potential leaders imagine such resources could usher in? I answer by examining circulating forms of economic, geologic, and brine mining knowledge generated for lithium during the Inter-American Cold War. This period was shaped by military designs, ideological confrontation and nuclear anxieties, as we all know, but also dynamic global power asymmetries and the legacies of 20th century mineral diplomacy, which were not kind to Latin American nations. In the last five years, as we rush to substitute oil, new lithium mine projects have boomed around the world, raising alarms about the social and environmental impacts all this new mining will have. Mining exhausts rivers and aquifers, destroys ecosystems and often leaves toxic waste behind. Farming and herding often become untenable, forcing families from their ancestral lands to find work in cities. 
Before its importance in light to lightweight portable batteries, lithium was valuable for its uses in nuclear fusion technology. This technology, seemingly forever in the future, has long held the promise of limitless, cheap, clean energy. The history of lithium's hopeful nuclear energy future is thus a reminder that non-carbon futures have been imagined in the past with unequal social and environmental consequences. What has not changed, however, is our reliance on minerals. Environmental history has taught us that modern societies are not good at substituting. We always use more of everything. We would need the resources of five planets if we all lived like the average US American, or only three planets if we lived like Europeans. If we each own our own electric car, we can look forward to being stuck in traffic in a quieter, cleaner car. While here, I will be writing and thinking of ways to reimagine development and progress, our ideas of the good life and our relations with non-humans. I will also attend events and speak with various actors involved in Germany's efforts to transition to electromobility and learn more about German geology and corporate history, which has played an important role in the development of lithium. Uh, while I am in Berlin, in my native country of Chile, Many are working to write a new constitution. And this effort is also full of hope for a more dignified future for a collective government and state capable of coping with climate change. I continue to work with Chilean colleagues on the potential of constitutional rights of nature and of feminist science to democratize how we create and share knowledge so we may all become better environmental stewards. In my free time, you will find me exploring this great city, reconnecting with old friends from Tegernsey, and cycling around the region. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lauren Benton, and I am the Anna Maria Kellen Fellow here at the American Academy in Berlin. I'm also a faculty member at Yale University, where my title is Barton M. Biggs, Professor of History and Professor of Law. It's an enormous pleasure to be here, and I, I want to begin by thanking everyone at the American Academy in Berlin uh, and its supporters for the very warm welcome this week, and also for all that you have done and will continue to do to make our stay here comfortable and productive. And in honor of our setting, I begin by quoting someone whose intellectual life spanned Germany and America. Hannah Arendt described war as from time immemorial, the final merciless arbiter of international disputes. This is the view of war that pervades most histories of armed conflict. That is the idea that war is a means for resolving disputes and producing peace or a return to peace. Working within this perspective, uh, historians of international law tell a story of humanity's long gradual project to use law to contain war's destructiveness and eventually in the 20th century to outlaw major wars under international law. But we know that law did not just serve to contain war. It also legitimated and sustained violence. And so my project, the book that I'll be working on while I'm here this spring, and I hope completing, uh, examines the legal framework of violence in European empires between about 1400 and 1900. So I group together a diverse set of actions under the heading of small wars. The phenomenon includes not just the anti-imperial insurgencies that have a, a classically acquired the name of small wars, but also a diverse range of forms of violence on the threshold between war and peace, such as chronic raiding, the seizure of captives, and measures short of war, like acts of reprisal and intervention. And um, although it's a global history, it is not comprehensive. I analyze case studies to expose wider patterns. So examples, some of the cases that I'm relying on include 16th century Portuguese maritime raiding in the Indian Ocean, colonial violence against Native Americans in 16th and 17th centuries, 
uh, 18th century proxy wars in South Asia, 19th century land wars against indigenous peoples in Australia and South America, and violence by patrolling navies in the 19th century Pacific. And I'm thinking about adding the Prussian-Danish uh, conflict. <laughs> Uh, I also consider how legal writers in Europe developed arguments about the legal foundations of limited war. And I actually want to argue that there is such a thing as a theory of limited war that appears in sort of bits and pieces in uh, classic writings on law and war over the centuries. So I juxtapose social and intellectual histories of imperial violence to generate, I hope, fresh perspectives on early international law and on what it means to be at war or at peace. I find that small wars, and I argue that they're a structural feature of global orders. So between about 1400 and 1750, Vast regional complexes of raiding and captive taking joined Europe to the rest of the world. In other words, everybody was doing it. Uh, rather than inventing new modes of conquest with new legal rationales, as we typically think, Europeans operated within this broadly shared framework uh, that legitimated raiding for plunder. Beginning in roughly the middle of the 18th century, a new regime, one that I call global armed peace, emerged. European powers, and eventually also the United States, claimed the status of enforcers of standards of conduct in war and assembled a permanent right of intervention. And that part of the story is not radically different than standard narratives, except that I situate the most important turns outside Europe uh, rather than within Europe and really in these decentered conflicts around the world. So working on this project has given me, among other things, uh, a new appreciation of continuities between imperial history and the present and a new set new sets of questions about those continuities. Uh, for example, it's very striking that campaigns of targeted killing and the war on terror have repurposed aspects of the legal framework of imperial violence. Uh, I very much look forward to talking with fellows and others about these findings and insights and learning from them uh, and learning from this great city. And I'm really very grateful for the opportunity for the chance at an extended period of time to focus on writing in this beautiful place. Thank you. Schurden uh, Abend, good evening. Uh, my name is Lawrence Douglas. I'm the Daimler Fellow at the American Academy, where it's a pleasure and an honor to be spending this term. Uh, when not in Berlin, I teach at uh, Amherst College, where I'm the James J. Grossfeld Professor of Law, Jurisprudence, and Social Thought. Um, at the Academy, I'll be pursuing two projects. Uh, the first is a manuscript that I've been working on for some time. Uh, that bears the tentative title of A Jurisprudence of Atrocity. Back in uh, 1965, uh, the German news weekly Der Spiegel published a, a long interview that the Spiegel publisher Rudolf Augstein um, conducted with the famous philosopher Karl Jaspers. And the topic was uh, Nazi era crimes. And Augstein asked Jaspers, uh, why it was that there was such a fixation on these crimes um, when, after all, Augstein said there had been other uh, nations such as France and Napoleon, um, which had also committed atrocities. And Jaspers pushed back against Augstein, and he argued that while Napoleon might have ordered crimes, his state in the essence, in its essence, had not been criminal. And the Nazi state, by contrast, uh, Jaspers insisted, had been a Verbrecherstaat, a criminal state, not a state that happened uh, now and again to commit crimes. A jurisprudence of atrocity asked what it means to call a state a Verbrecherstaat, a criminal state. Um, from the perspective of traditional Western political and legal thought, uh, the very term Verbrecherstaat sounds almost oxymoronic. Uh, by the lights of this tradition, 
uh, the state uh, shielded by the mantle of sovereignty um, was assumed to be the guarantor of um, security, of order and lawfulness. So what makes a state criminal? What are the paradigmatic acts of criminality? And what do justice and accountability mean when we're dealing with state-sponsored uh, state crimes that may enlist the participations of tens of thousands of functionaries and may be supported by a complex a logistical and organizational apparatus. Uh, this project emerged is out of my previous work in international criminal law, in which I've written uh, quite extensively about the Nuremberg, Eichmann, and uh, Damjanjuk uh, trials, as well as the uh, Milosevic uh, proceeding in The Hague and the ongoing uh, Nashri al-Qaeda um, case uh, before um, the military commission in Guantanamo Bay. My second project also merges out of uh, some previous work of mine. Um, in early 2020, I published a short book called uh, Will He Go? Uh, Trump and the Coming Election Meltdown. And in it, I asked what at the time was a speculative, a speculative uh, question. And I asked how well is our system of constitutional and federal law uh, prepared to deal with say a sitting president who might lose a reelection and yet refuse to concede defeat. And in this book, I argued that our system is not well prepared at all for such an eventuality. And in writing uh, Will He Go, I became increasingly convinced uh, that far from serving as an effective prophylactic or bulwark against democratic erosion, the US constitution for all its greatness is now actually contributing in important ways to our present political crisis. So I would like to write a uh, crossover book um, that argues that it is not sufficient to say that our present hyperpartisanship uh, is simply threatening our constitutional order. Rather, I want to argue that the constitution itself now poses threats to our continued political stability. Uh, the manuscript has the working title of the Constitution is the crisis. Uh, so these are the happy topics uh, with which I'll be gratefully spending my time at this wonderful academy and in this city with its rich and fraught history. Thank you. Good evening. You'll be happy to know I am the last glass of water. <laughs> I'm Deborah Amos. Uh, I am a correspondent for National Public Radio. I'm a professor of journalism where I teach undergraduates how to think and write like a journalist. Um, it is such an honor to be here. I'm the Axel Springer Fellow, appropriately enough, at this academy, and I feel like I've come to the right place because my topic is accountability. And I feel that this is the place to study it. It is part of history here. Uh, it's part of memory culture here. But I'm looking at events that happen not in Germany, but in Syria, in a brutal war that's not over yet. It's a war that's cost nearly half a million dead, half the country displaced, 100,000 people have been forcibly disappeared. And what that means is they've been swept up into a notorious prison system. 14,000 people, and that's at the least, have been tortured there. And all of this in an attempt to stop a civil uprising in 2011. In 2015, Syrians began an exodus. Families walked through European forests, they packed themselves in the back of trucks, they took rickety boats across the Mediterranean because the risk of death by drowning was preferable to life in Syria. Some 800,000 Syrians have settled here. The exodus was enlightening because as it turned out, they weren't fleeing from war, as brutal as it was, they were fleeing something else, the Syrian prison system. This is the recent testimony of a torture survivor in a German court in Koblenz. He said exposure to live bullets is scary enough when unarmed. 
and being bombarded with all manner of weapons, including airplanes, is even scarier. But nothing can describe the horror of being arrested in Syria. And that's why they came to Europe. Why Germany? That's not so clear, but it turns out it was a significant choice. Even in the year that the citizens' revolt took off in 2011, German prosecutors began investigating Syrian war crimes. Syrian human rights lawyers were known to German judges. Some had been recognized by the German judiciary for the work that they were doing in Damascus. One example is Anwar el Buni, and he ran a human rights center in the capital city. Germany issued him a special visa in 2014, which probably saved his life. And they did the same for many Syrian activists. So once al Buni got here, he and other Syrian activists accelerated a legal process. They could contribute the Arabic language. They had an inner knowledge of the prison system because so many of them had served there. Plus, they understood that there were potential witnesses in Europe. These were Syrians who were survivors, and they could supply a database of torture survivors who were living here. On January 13th, the first Syrian war crimes trial concluded after more than 100 days of testimony, 80 witnesses, including dozens of brave torture survivors. A guilty verdict, crimes against humanity, and a life sentence for a former Syrian colonel, Anwar Rislan. He was in charge of interrogations at one of the most notorious prisons, Branch 251. I was there that day. I was there because I'm here. We lined up at 5 a.m. to get a seat in that small courtroom. Syrian activists and survivors came as early as the journalists. They wanted to see that verdict with their own eyes because for the first time, a senior member of the Assad regime was being held accountable for murder and torture. The trial was far from perfect, and Raslan was less than a perfect first prosecution. He was a mid-level colonel who defected two years into the uprising. Yet the value of the prosecution goes beyond that one case. It's the victory of years of meticulous work of Syrian activists and German lawyers. It's likely to be the first brick and a wall of prosecutions in Europe. I came to the American Academy to examine the idea of accountability, of justice, of universal jurisdiction. Can German courts hold the Syrian regime to account even while it's still in power? Has won the war? Where neighboring countries and even some in Europe want to push normalization of this regime, ignoring the evidence of widespread torture in Syria's vast prison system. Another trial begins this week. A third is expected in September. Germany has emerged in the forefront of prosecutions of former Syrian officials in Europe's national courts. Other European states are preparing indictments. There's more than a thousand case files open. It's a reckoning for the atrocities of the Assad regime. But considering the scale of the crimes and the time commitment for each individual trial, can justice ever really be achieved? Could it be that these prosecutions are symbolic? Even the German lawyers at the center of the trial recognize the long road ahead. It's a choice between this trial and nothing, said one after the trial was over. This is a start, said another lawyer, a way to establish the mosaic of the truth. While I'm here, I want to delve into German attitudes towards these trials, a country that welcomed thousands of Syrians until the backlash began. Even so, the German judiciary has set a standard with universal jurisdiction. The most grievous crimes can now be prosecuted at a time when international tribunals are paralyzed by international politics. My timing is right. To see if this movement, prosecuting Syrian war crimes in national courts, becomes a way to offer hope for victims. As for the Syrian community, most will settle here in Germany. They'll learn the language, become good German citizens. Because as long as there is no accountability for unspeakable crimes, it's not safe for them to go home. Thank you. Is that really for me? 
Well, I think on the basis of uh, 815, 813ths of our class, it's gonna be a fantastic term here at the American Academy. And I wanna thank the fellows for all, for sharing uh, these insights into their work. At the beginning, I, I said that there were several fellows, five in fact, who are not here in person. Um, so we asked them to pre-record uh, brief discussions uh, of their work. We'll begin with a video which uh, presents the Future Traditions Project of Du Yun, who is our composer in residence this spring. Du Yun is a composer, multi-instrumentalist, performance artist, activist, and curator for new music. She is a professor of composition at the Peabody Institute of Johns Hopkins University and a distinguished visiting professor at the Shanghai Conservatory of Music. She works at the intersections of orchestral, opera, chamber music, theater, cabaret, musical theater, oral tradition, public performances, sound installation, electronics, and visual arts. And that's a lot of intersections. So anyway, without uh, further ado, we'll look at Duyon and then we'll hear from Damian Fernandez, Howard Coe, Etel Solingen, and Michael Abramowitz. In 2010, I went to the Emirates with my friend and collaborator Shazia Sikanda to work on a piece engaging local amateur poets and musicians. Since then, I have gone to Pakistan to work with boys and girls from the walled city in Lahore with Ali Seti and Shazia. Then followed collaborations from Istanbul, Palestine to Central Asia. And I began to go into different regions in China for the regional traditional opera troops trying to explore possibilities of making new works with them. In the summer of 2019, I went to Yishu, the Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture, to work with a group of first-generation young kids in their family who go to schools. I began to wonder what is the opposite of our tradition? What is the future for our tradition? Are they opposing each other? Or rather, could they build upon each other? I think we need new forms of collaborations. And for many people in many corners of the world, they would like to be seen and heard. Julian Crouch. 
我们因为要创造这个生命，要把自己的经历和想法都要灌注到这个纸上，好不好？慢慢的动这张纸张，慢慢的想。你们合同中文有可能这两个人可不可以变成一个 ？Maybe it walks or maybe it jumps. 然后慢慢看看他一步一步应该是怎么走。啊，球，一步一步是。My name is Damian Fernandez, Associate Professor of History at Northern Illinois University. I'm delighted to be here today, even if in, an, in a virtual format, as the Nina Maria Gorison Fellow in History for the spring of 2022. Let me start by expressing my heartfelt gratitude to the American Academy in Berlin for this unique opportunity to learn from the other fellows in my cohort, pursue my own research, and create intellectual connections with colleagues in German institutions. I'm a historian of late antiquity, roughly the period between the later Roman Empire in the fourth century and the early Islamic Caliphate in the eighth century CE. Not long ago, historians considered this period as quote unquote, the dark ages of Europe and associated the end of the Roman Empire in the West with a supposed collapse of civilization. Although most scholars, myself included, would disagree with this assessment today, the so-called fall of Rome still evokes ideas of decline and chaos among broader audiences. My work is therefore part of a larger effort by the scholarly community to explain a period that included violence and disruption, but also transformation and creativity. Above all, I am interested in explaining how individuals and communities navigated momentous social and political changes as historical actors, and how new forms of legitimacy, domination, and resistance emerged amid these transformations, all themes that are familiar to observers of empire, whatever their historical period. My current research focuses on the legal and political culture of one of the successor kingdoms to the Roman Empire, the Visigothic Kingdom. This kingdom encompassed Hispania and Septimania, roughly Portugal, Spain, and part of southern France, from the sixth century until the Arab conquest in 711. My first major project involves the legal history of the kingdom. 
I am co-editing a translation and commentary of the Liber Judicarum or Visigothic Code, a seventh century compilation of laws issued by Visigothic kings. We owe the 1902 standard Latin edition of this text to the German legal historian Karl Soimer, who lived not far from here in Steglitz. Rather than decline, these laws conjured up continuities and transformations of Roman law and the incorporation of new legal principles in the aftermath of empire. My second major project and my focus during my fellowship at the American Academy is the study of rebellion and political culture in the Visigothic kingdom. My current book project looks at the treatment of rebels in Visigothic literature as tyrants, invaders, and sinners. Indeed, a remarkable feature of Visigothic society was its almost obsessive engagement with the ideas of rebellion and political usurpation. In part, this was how intellectuals and political elites coped with the unpleasant reality that about half of the Visigothic kings accepted to the throne after a re rebellion or a coup. This feature made the region infamous throughout the Mediterranean War. One anonymous chronicle from then, then distant Burgundy described Visigothic rebellious politics as, quote unquote, the disease of the Goths. But emphasizing the violent nature of Visigothic political culture strays too close to historiographical traditions of fall, decline, and dark ages. The Visigothic kingdom was not particularly violent by comparison with its contemporary polities, such as the Frankish kingdoms or the Eastern Roman or Byzantine empire, or most of its preceding or succeeding states. I suggest instead that the writer's interest in rebellion stemmed from the need for foundational discussions on the nature of kinship and polity. In our contemporary world, an attempt to subvert an election result through a violent attack against one of the seats of government leads to broader discussions on legitimacy and the constitutional, political, and social problems of a nation. Similarly, when Visigothic laws, church councils, chronicles, hagiographies, and letters evoked rebellion, they used this opportunity to discuss, negotiate, and challenge the extent of royal power and the nature and boundaries of the political community. Some of the questions these authors asked included, for instance, what are the limits of the king's power to punish rebels? What happened to kings who were or acted as usurpers? Is the rebel part of the political community or not? Is religious dissidence an act of rebellion against the king? And many other questions. Ultimately, I intend to produce a political anthropology of the Visigothic kingdom to reflect upon both the process of state building and resistance against the state in the aftermath of empire. I will expand upon this topic on my public lecture at the American Academy on April 26th in conversation with Professor Stefan Esters from Freie Universität Berlin, one of the most prominent scholars of the early Middle Ages. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Howard Koh. I'm a professor at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health in the Harvard Kennedy School. And I have the great honor of joining you as the Bayer Fellow in Health and Tech and let me start by thanking Dan Benjamin and his great, great team at the Academy. I had the privilege of coming to Berlin last fall to start my fellowship and spend a glorious couple of weeks in Berlin. And I am a physician who has had the privilege of serving in multiple positions in government as well. I'm the former Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health and also the former U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health in the Obama administration. When you have the privilege of looking at health from all those perspectives as a professor and researcher and then state and federal health official, you get to see some of the big picture health challenges facing our world. Last fall, I got to present at the Academy about the 
global COVID pandemic that's still engulfing much of the world right now. Uh, when I return this spring to join all of you, I'll be talking about addressing and ending the forever pandemic of global tobacco, an issue that I have spent about 30 years of my career studying and working on, because this is an astonishing public health challenge that affects all of us. I'm sure if I mentioned the term tobacco to any of you personally, you could tell me about people that you love and care about who have suffered and died from tobacco dependence. And we have to do much, much more as a global community to address this preventable suffering. There has been a multinational tobacco industry that has glamorized and normalized this product for decades to unfortunately create the outcomes that we have all seen last century and this century with respect to tobacco related death. On the other hand, there have been efforts from public health professionals around the world to join together to denormalize and deglamorize tobacco use. And the best example is the so called World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And I'll be saying much more about that in my presentation this upcoming spring. We have to advance those policies, but also be even more creative in trying to do our best to end this threat once and for all for future generations. We, we need our children and our children's ch children to be tobacco free, to have any chance of reaching their highest attainable standard of health. So that's what I'll be addressing when I join you this spring. I'm really looking forward to meeting all of you. It's a great, great honor to be a fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. And thank you all. I look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Good evening. Uh, it's a special pleasure to be with you today, although it would have been even better to be there in person. I'd like to thank the American Academy in Berlin and its staff for honoring me with the Holbrook Prize and for all of the kind welcoming. The leitmotif of my work is an effort to understand the connection between economics and security in international relations. For instance, I've explored the relationship between a country's approach to global economic interdependence on the one hand and its proclivity to acquire or renounce nuclear weapons on the other. Other work compared uh, regional institutions around the world uh, in economics and security, or how regional orders are constructed and maintained, the EU being one example. I have also worked on the concept of transnational diffusion, the diffusion of political models, economic policies, democratic values, etc., from country to country. And other projects compared the origins of World War I in 1914 with East Asia today. But my project for Berlin, though building on earlier work, also tackles an entirely new topic. I started working on the role of global supply chains in international relations about in about 2013, at a time when supply chains were far, a far more obscure phenomenon than they are today. But COVID-19 has made it more central, although the geopolitical tensions preceding COVID-19 between the US and China really enhanced their visibility even prior to COVID-19. But supply chains and the struggle for technological primacy are now at the heart of that competition. While in Berlin, I intend to examine contemporary uh, European Union dilemmas regarding supply chain interdependence and diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis China and implications for the transatlantic alliance. Along with uh, colleagues uh, at uh, the American Academy in Berlin, I have begun already some preliminary steps in the conception of the Richard Holbrook workshop on EU, uh, China, uh, EU, US relations, diplomacy, geopolitics, and global supply chains. And I really look forward uh, to meeting you all soon in person. Thank you. Good evening. My project addresses one of the biggest global trends of the past two decades, 
the dramatic erosion in democratic governance all over the world. My organization, Freedom House, has tracked a 15-year decline in the health of democracy globally. More countries are experiencing declines in political rights than experiencing improvements. And last year, the declines outpaced the improvements by the biggest margins we've seen at Freedom House since the democratic recession began in 2006. The erosion is particularly striking when you consider the people affected. The vast majority of the roughly 8 billion people on earth, or roughly three in four of those people, live in countries where freedom is declining. Less than 20% of people live in what Freedom House considers a free country, which is the lowest proportion we've seen since 1995. What's particularly concerning is that the erosion is taking place not only in countries where you might expect it, such as China, Russia, Turkey, uh, but also in states that were once considered strong democracies, Hungary and Poland, India, even the United States. There are no shortage of explanations for these negative trends. Uh, among the factors that have been cited are populism, globalization, declining trust in elites and government institutions, the revolution in social media, and the active promotion of authoritarianism and illiberal practices by such powers as China and Russia. My project tries to tackle a different question, what to do about the problem. Democracy is a historical tie that binds the United States and Europe together. And while there are internal challenges on both sides of the ocean, the need for collective voice and action has never been greater. In recent years, we've seen the beginning of efforts in both the United States and Europe to develop new strategies for combating democratic erosion. At Freedom House, we worked on a project with the McCain Institute and the CSIS think tank uh, to develop a US strategy to support democracy and counter authoritarianism. Our task will be to try to establish how we can take that conversation across the Atlantic and to look at how established democracies on both sides of the oceans can develop shared strategies to advance the cause of democracy. I expect we will discuss and analyze both the Biden administration's approach to democracy and the approach by European countries and to look at what are the most effective tools uh, and strategies grouped around such issues as combating disinformation, fighting corruption, protecting elections from digital manipulation and many other issues. In the end, our hope is to identify a shared transatlantic agenda for the defense and support of democracy. There are a lot of problems with democracy, evidently. But anyway, um, as you can see, this is going to be an incredibly rich semester. And I want to just say uh, to all of those who are joining us virtually that I hope you will uh, tune in for these many different um, uh, events and, uh, and join us online. You will find the dates uh, on our website, www.americanacademy.de, and in the printed program, which uh, many of you will have received with your newsletters. Uh, I, if you don't already get it, I, I very much recommend subscribing to our email newsletter so that you know what is going on here. Before I say goodbye, I want to once again thank Christoph March for an incredibly learned and provocative uh, keynote address, uh, which I will be thinking about for uh, quite some time to come. And I also want to thank all of our fellows for giving us uh, some insight into their really interesting uh, projects. Thank you for joining us here for the spring 2022 fellows presentation. And good day, good evening, good afternoon to you all.